What is up, people of the music verse? Welcome to the Anna Creates podcast. I am your host, Alex Krotz, and this is my show where I bring those studio coffee break chats with other creators to you to help inspire and educate you on all things music production. This episode, I am joined by Dr. Jay Hodgson, who is a good friend of mine and who I've worked on many, many projects with over the last number of years. Jay is a man of many talents. He is an accomplished bass player and songwriter and musician in general, but he's also a really great mastering engineer, as you'll hear throughout this conversation. He also has his PhD and is a professor at Western University, as well as a published author with a number of academic books on the topics in the realm of music production and mastering. And I am proud to say that I am a contributing author to a couple of those, which is just so cool. And on top of all of that, he also is creating quite a resume for himself in the world of visual art. So, you should definitely go check out his stuff. He does really, really great work. No matter what he puts his mind to, he just knocks it out of the park. In this conversation, Jay brings a very unique view to the art and craft of mastering, its place in the world of music production, and his philosophy around music creation in general. And his passion for all things music really shines through whether you're talking to him in a conversation like this or working with him in any capacity. It's frankly not surprising that he has a piece PhD, when you listen to how he discusses these things, he's definitely done his research and he gets really into it. It's absolutely amazing. There is a lot of great stuff in here. It is a wild ride, but he comes up with so many different ways to look at things in the world of creation in general, and especially in the world of mastering, which is often thought of as a bit of a voodoo world. So he brings a bit of clarity to that and a different way of viewing it. He's clearly a guy who knows his stuff, but he also likes to bend the rules and doesn't like to put things into a checklist of sorts. He's all about experimentation and just having fun with what you're doing. His number one rule above all else, it seems, is does it sound good? There is a lot in this conversation. So without further ado, let's dive in. Dr. Jay Hodgson, you are an accomplished mastering engineer, educator, visual artist, and musician. Welcome to the In It Creates podcast. There's a lot that I want to talk about today, but first, tell us a little bit about your creative space, where you do your mastering mostly, and kind of a little bit about your background and how you got into mastering to end up where you are now, because I think it's quite unique. So tell us a little bit about that. For sure. Yeah. Uh, so um, I, I have a, a different sort of background. One of the things that I was I really wanted to be careful about when I was getting into all of this was I didn't want to have to remortgage my house um, to pay for the gear that would attract the clients who I'd have to inevitably exploit. You know, I was, I had a PhD, I was teaching music. I, I was at a research institution where they were like, you can define your research. And this was right at a time when mastering was becoming a boutique practice globally. So I, I was lucky enough also to be in a place where there was a hemianechoic chamber, which means that it's, uh, there's no reflections above 60 hertz. Um, mm. And the reflections below 60 hertz are flanked and happening in another room. So it's like, it's a, it's not perfect. I had to, to deaden it a bit more, but a, a colleague before me who retired uh, had this space that was set up as a research place where they would basically try to recreate the acoustics of different concert halls and opera singers would come in and practice oh. in relation to a place they were going to perform in the future. It's a really cool idea. Um, cool. I'm not sure how it was actualized, but the, the premise is that it was like, um, you know, an acoustic hollow deck, which was right. really cool. Um, but anyway, so I got that space um, and I, I'd been into mastering and recording. I mean, I, I'd been, I was lucky to have started working when I was like 16. I was in high school and I was, you know, at McClear Path A and, and participating in recording sessions that like went platinum. Uh, right. I didn't get credited because I wasn't union. And at the time I was like, that's okay. And now that I'm older, I'm like, God damn it. Put my name on that thing, you know? <laughs> um, right. Yep. Yeah. But, um, you know, and I was, and, and I, but I was, I was significantly younger than the people in the band. 
It was right. it was more like an adult contemporary type of thing, but they were somehow they'd lucked into a number one in Australia. This was during a little Celtic phase in the mid '90s. Sort of the Pogues were big, Braveheart was big, and um, so I didn't feel like I fit with them. Uh, right. I was like a weird, awkward kid, um, and but because of that, I fit right in with the engineers, right? Right, right, <laughs> yeah, totally. Yeah, so like they'd all go out to have their drinks and party, and I was like 16 and staring at these machines that would make lights, and I was, it, I thought I was looking at like the the cockship, the 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 what do you call it, the. Um, Starship the, Enterprise? The cock, no, the, yeah, the cockpit of a gray alien <laughs> spaceship, basically. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And there were, like, these aliens back there who were, like, just moving things really quietly. And every so often, what I noticed was that, though, people deferred to them. And so these musicians who I thought were... And then I, I got really interested in who defers to who, and I would follow that up the chain, and I was really lucky to have been, you know, there in places where they were doing what we used to call glass masters, my... my you know, partner over in, in England, uh, Russ Hepworth Sawyer, he refers to it as something else and says I'm I'm a moron for referring it to it that way. I probably am, but I know a few other people from my era from, you know, where I was that would call them glass masters too. But I was there in those sessions and I would see that they would apply limiting. Sometimes they do a little bit of adjusting and I got, re you know, so it wasn't, it, it wasn't just sort of like preparing this thing for distribution. And I realized no one else was in the room to check them. And I heard them do something that affected something that I was on and blended me back a bit. And I didn't say anything. I was too timid. But I was like, oh, there are these people even further down the line who get to do, who make final decisions, you know? Right. And I got right. interested in mastering that way. And so it became like a research thing. Anyways, at the university, I continued on. I'd always sort of had an interest in it. Um but I was also, because I'd been in, like, you know, nothing really impresses me much. I'm at an age and, like, I've I've played with people who had a police escort to play the Super Bowl halftime, like, ha halftime show. Like, these were my, my friends. I was lucky enough in college. Somehow I would play with them in bands. Um, uh, so, you know, it, I, I tend not, I just these people are just people doing these things. I don't have that. Um, and so I, I actually got really interested in initially just why do mastering engineers always act as though their craft is some weird mathematical process? I've yet to see anything um, that was like, you know, quantum mathematics with a bit of like magic dust, you know, in, in, right. in a, and I started to like hang out with mastering engineers and I noticed when the client left, there was none of that happening. There was, right. that, that was when like the artistry would happen and yeah. And so I just fell into it. I started getting like fascinated by it, went to see my Dean and said, you know, you hired me to teach songwriting and record production, or I should say the Dean before you hired me to teach songwriting and record production. I had to write a book because the dean before me told me that the term production was a typographical error on my letter of appointment and that it should right. have read publishing. And so that was like a way of saying, you're not welcome here. But I just right. was like, I'll write a book. Fine. <laughs> you know? And so I wrote a book. But then yeah. I went and met with the dean and said, listen, this should be my, my research load because this is what I teach. Right. Um, and it changes all the time and fast. And like I uh, and like my students want me to have some awareness of what's going on in the industry. So I'm right. not teaching them how to transfer to a glass master to, to make CDs in 2022, you know? Right, right. <laughs> um, yeah, yeah. yeah, and so I just started contacting all my old friends and saying, you know, um, I, I get research credit for this, so it may seem weird. Um, and I had, like, I had a background, right? Like, I, you weren't just going to send me something and I was going to, like, dub it down to four-track cassette tape and send it back and say, that's done, you know? Right, I, right, I had yeah. some sense of what I was doing, but I, I said, you know, I just, um, I want to really, really, like, um, uh, develop an expertise in this area, um, and uh, I don't believe I'm going to do that by reading, emulating what other people do. I want to just work on it, and preferably I would like to work with labels and go, like, in-house with labels, so I'd like to I would like to define some electronic labels sounds that way if I can. Uh, and and people I was lucky enough to just sort of like 
get on those. And by the end of it, I was clearing like thousands of tracks a year that were actually like going out on labels, on vinyl. Some of them would, would get like a Juno nom. Some of them, I did the, the, the German country album of the year somehow one year, (laughs) you know, yeah, I would, and I would just be, it was like, it was the, the ideal world for me. Talk about like being on the Starship Enterprise. I'd be like in this room, people had no idea who I was even. They couldn't pick me out. When I'd go to Berlin, all the techno people would be like, come hang out with us. I was like, I will die. My bedtime's 11 now, you know? <laughs> right, right. <laughs> and you, you like, and, and you'd be like, fine, we'll make 11. But that's like 72 hours later. No, uh, like, just send me the, tr- I love this. Just send me the stuff. I, you, you're lucky you have like this geek who's going to sit in a room, do a bit of yoga, uh, maybe have a beer or two and spend the rest of the time mastering, trying stuff out, you know? And um, yeah, and so that was it. And so o- over time, it was really cool. I'll say by the end of that ride, I would actually get contacted every so often, no idea how, by people in like underground techno in like Berlin, Ibiza, these places. And they would say, did you master this track? And and inevitably it was always like yeah I did and they'd say okay I'd like to I'd like you to master my stuff I was like how the hell did you hear it even like how would you even know right. so there but I did I had done enough that there was like uh, I think from from hip hop and grunge I had a real tolerance I had no sense of right or wrong so I right. wasn't going to be one of those mastering engineers who'd be like um I'm sorry but at forty hertz it has to be minus six other you know I was just like. Let's right. make it loud. Loud is beautiful. Distortion has its aesthetic places. Let's do it. Let inter inter sample peaks. Sure, why not? Let's do like <laughs> no one's yeah. no one's reading these files. It sounds good. It's like going to a Metallica album and saying like, uh, "Your guitar tone's distorted." Right. So, yeah. Of <laughs> like, course it is. <laughs> yeah. Exactly. Uh, anyway, so that's like that's a, a long answer, but that's the only way I can answer it. I kind of like drifted through this stream. I never set out to do it when did you kind of click in because it sounds like you started it out going i'm going to research this and i want to know more about this and whatever but when did it kind of click and go i thoroughly enjoy this and i want to do this because you don't you don't start researching and then master thousands of tracks and yeah. keep going for years <laughs> yeah. you know what i mean you obviously like it <laughs> at yeah. some point well it that's clicked. it so- i did i i absolutely loved it it's this really cool um uh I, I don't know how else to say it except for that it feels very much like um, uh, an austerity practice which creates ecstasy. I know that sounds bizarre, uh. but it's like you're so constricted in what yeah. you can and can't do that in a way you're kind of, you know, you're like you're bringing out aspects of the of this this full balance and you don't necessarily get caught up in the syntax. Like, it's really neat right. to get something in. I remember I cleared a record uh, one time, just, just to this point. And, um, like, it wasn't until three hours into the session that I realized it was, like, straightforward, dogmatic Christian rock. <laughs> I thought it was heavy metal. <laughs> they were talking oh about, God. like, yeah, yeah. Um, anyways. Great. Yeah, and I just loved it. Like, I just, there's something about not have, being able to treat it as research in a way. It's like sort of the way the composers on faculty here approach composition. You're allowed to follow particular paths that wouldn't necessarily be particularly profitable. Like, for instance, I got really into uh, mid side work on like nine minute minimal techno, which a lot of people wouldn't bother with. But for me, I was like, this is a way to really ramp up the bass, but keep it clean. And so it won't get rejected. Cause like I would be, I'd be working with DJs sometimes who'd say like, Hey, I need this track mastered for Bergheim um, or like Loveland or some of these clubs that were like really big legendary clubs. Um, and that's a totally different beast. Like that's the literally, you know, it's, you're dealing with techno where you have all this energy uh, like under 150 hertz, but really you got to be mono up to like 350 and there's like things you got to do. And um, anyways, and I just, I was fascinated by it. I loved it. It, for me, it was like uh, a, like I said, it was like this kind of like austerity practice where you're involved in this creative process. You're, there's this kind of creativity. It's not really meta. It's doesn't, and it's totally personal. 
So it's kind of, you know, it's sort of like your your only job is to know where a mix should go. And and that was my that put me at odds with a lot of mastering engineers. Like I, I will say there are a few caveats. Like for instance, you know, you don't clear something where the stair where the master is plus one. You know? Right. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, it's like you know, you have to know what your numbers are, and and you have to know what you're going for. But right, um, but it really is far more artistic than people realize. I think so. Totally. I like, yeah. I I look at it as like um, uh, I do a lot of visual art, and if there's a piece that's going for showing or something, often you'll you'll put a varnish on it. Right. Um, that is not the the like. Um, Again, like the the sort of like packaging process that it sounds like it's very artistic. How many layers? Right. How light is it? What you know? Um, right. Okay. Yeah. And so I guess after having spent like, I, I mean, I I did the math the other day. I've been actually, my first session was thirty years ago. Um, okay. Thirty one wow. years ago. Yeah. Uh, yeah. 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 <laughs> uh, but uh, so I, I you know I like. The the recording process itself is cool, but you know my interests have moved on. I'm like I'm interested in different things, um, right? And mastering right. was just this thing where it, right away I I was like, this is an amazing process, right? And um, if you tr treat it not in a cynical way. I I I, may, I I set this one rule for myself. I said, you know how you're going to know this, Alex, and and all the people who like <laughs> watch you, everyone who's worked in records knows this. That when yeah. when the talent goes into the into the into the performance space, yeah. the control room gets super catty. <laughs> Yes. <laughs> yeah. The tech, the tech people, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> the behind the scenes folk, right? Let loose. <laughs> yeah. So I just like I I I. It was almost like taking a vow. I said like my, one of my primary things in research here is I'm never going to say a negative word about whatever I work on, um, and I found that that just like opened everything up. And I started to, I just reached this place where it was like this a totally different perspective on music, on communication, on sound, all that stuff. It, it would be because you're seeing it like the bird's eye view. You can still do stuff to it, but it's a bird's eye view versus like a mixing engineer where you're, you're in it. You're soloing the guitar Absolutely. and the lead guitar on the left hand side. That's the lower octave. Like mm -hmm. it's, it's very in in the weeds and the mastering while you can obviously do some pretty incredible stuff you are seeing it and you you're Absolutely. constrained yeah. by that overarching bird's eye view of the track and the record i i suppose yes and i i would say it it like it absolutely informed also the like capital a academic side of my research because when you think about right. it when you listen to a record yeah which uh, recording you don't hear sound per se you don't hear the sound that you and I sitting in a room together would be making. And we know this because the psycho in, in, from mixing, right? The psychoacoustic profile of that sound, hard left, this is off, it's, it's back from, from center, et cetera, et cetera. It's fixed and it's repeatable. And so if I were to set up two speakers, uh, no matter how far I walked in between and through them, I'd never be any closer to the snare drum. If I put on headphones and ran eight city blocks, I'd never be any closer or further from the snare drum. And so I, I got to thinking about it and I was like, you know, when we listen to a record, we think we're hearing sounds. It's mixed. It's designed to trick our neuropsychophysiology into believing it detects the presence of multiple sounds. So I always you know, start with a real easy one for students. I play them when the levee breaks and I say, what do you think you're hearing? And they'll say, you know, kick drum, snare drum, blues harp, electric guitar, you know, vocals, bass, etc. And I'll say, you're actually not. You're hearing a single sound produced by headphone or speaker technology designed to trick you into believing you're detecting the presence of multiple sounds. And so the mastering engineer hears the one sound, understands that the purpose the syntactic purpose is to convey to you multiple sounds, you know, or, or to represent sound in such a way that it's self-evident. So, you know, looking at the screen right now, it's very clear to you and I, we're seeing some kind of 
technological construct that that so closely mimics you in such real time that I'm like I'm looking at Alex for some reason but we know that there's a, a that that it's a representation. I know you're not behind my laptop, you know. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah. I mean, I'm, it's it's early enough that I know that. Later at night, maybe. Yeah, no. we don't know. Yeah, but yeah, but for some reason, when we listen to records, that mediation, that screen, whatever that is, we don't have the terminology. We haven't developed the terminology for it because we don't think of it that way. We only so. So, I mean, if you want to get capital A academic, if any of your viewers slash oh, listeners yeah, are totally. really into it, you know, <laughs> I would just say that that the ontology of recorded sound, the nature of its being is very different from acoustic phenomena. Yet we think about it and study it the way it would be like studying fashion photography, but only according to how models pose, what models look like, where mm. the camera was, you know, right. Um and so I just mastering for me was all about that that hidden language. Whereas mixing for me is like the the grammar of the sentence itself. You know, so it's, where does the comma go? Is that a hard dash? Is that a semicolon? Is that a period? I'm curious though. Like I, I knowing you, I and and knowing your professor, and you you are obviously very into that. You've dedicated a lot of your life to that. I can see why mastering one, you see it this way and two, you're more uh, engaged in that than some people. Some people yeah. don't think of mastering as much. They, they kind of like, I want to either be the player or I want to be the engineer or most of the time mixer producer. Like, yeah. Uh, mastering's kind of just this thing that happens to most people. They don't look at it this way. <laughs> yes. And I, I think it's, I think it's changing. I think that, um, mastering is becoming and i'm gonna going to to big caveat here yeah but mastering is becoming obsolete in the in the in the way that it was i don't mean extinct i always liked what marshall McLuhan had to say about the distinction between obsolete and extinct he'd say obsolete just means it doesn't have a required social function anymore so Uh. you know the car gets introduced you're still passing horse-drawn carriages if you take the back roads uh, up north, but it's it's kind of hard to find somebody who makes buggy whips. So right. the whole infrastructure around it, and and in a way, mastering was kind of like a buggy whip thing, mm. um, and and I think that that's a, a misunder a fundamental misunderstanding of what mastering is that was perpetrated by mastering engineers. So the the. There is this notion where mastering is this like arm's length peer review type of thing. So if I mix a record, I don't want to master it, right? Because I'm too close to it. Like you said, you're in there, you've done this, you've done that, like that matters to you. You have an emotional, personal connection with the sounds and you cannot make an objective. I mean, say what you want about objectivity, but you you cannot get past your own, you can't, you can't get past your projections, you know, you're, you're just like, yeah. So, so there's that aspect of it. Um, and a lot of the labels I worked with really depended on that. So when I would interact with them, I was very careful to, I was always clear to say, I, I dig it. I never worked on anything I didn't like ever. I, I like, I love music. I have that luxury because of my position, but I, I love it. Um, but I would always, some people wanted the, the, you know, the older dude who's been at it for a while, doesn't necessarily think it's cool or not cool, but, but it like deeply loves the craft and is going to write back and say, listen, this is hitting minus 0.3. There's no intersample peaks. It's like, you know, it's, it's as loud as it can be. The RMS is off the charts. Remember, back, remember RMS? Yeah. Oh yeah. <laughs> and then, yeah. <laughs> and, um, and, uh, but it's not hyper compressed, you know, and, um, uh, there's still an artistry to it, but they wanted more like what what initially was like the European model of mastering, where mastering was the first stage of distribution. Right. Whereas when I'd work with other labels, like real underground techno labels, um, and they were they were playing like Berghain, and they they just wanted this damn thing to like melt people's brains. Um, it was much more like the cowboy North American approach to mastering where it's the, the last stage of mixing. And so you get back and say like, oh man, this thing's got such a fat booty now. Oh, you know, and, and neither of them are false. Like you're not faking it. It's just the mastering engineer, like you said, 
some people want them over there in in an evaluative sense, and some people want them over there as like, uh, you know, one of them it's like a dad, one of them's like a brother, you know, uh, is the best way I can put it. With the dad, you, you're not going to quite go that far in the humor, you know, whereas with your brother, you might go too far, you know. Right. <laughs> uh, it's the only way I can put it, you know. <laughs> I love that. I love that. Yeah. So when you say that it's becoming obsolete or, or changing, I mean, it started out mo obviously more as like a mastering was the thing to make sure that the vinyl didn't break. And like, yes, there was absolutely. Like literally yeah. started as quality science control. and quality yeah. control. And like, although, although just to push back on that a little bit. There was a there was a transfer element, and because of the the inherent self noise and playback technology, the volume of program from the master to the transferred copies was always up to the discretion of the mastering engineer, and was always done in relation to what is the self noise of the playback apparatus. So the total volume has always been an artistic discretion of mastering. So has that changed now? Because with of loudness, of loudness standards and like <laughs> yeah. Spotify's like we need this and Netflix we need this and for, first of all they all have they all have different numbers so I just know like, you find your number uh, and 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 really I thought the whole process was redundant uh, I was turfed from a lot of conversations about this in the first hand because I think I'm just like. Uh, it, it, it was amazing to me how so I came up in the early 90s when it was like what you want to record like in a burned out bay. Awesome. Cool. Like here's 50 bucks, go make a record to how conservative it became around the early 2010s because mastering engineers had been really successful in marketing this idea that there was this new loudness war right. uh, and that they alone really knew how to uh, create something with dynamic range. And I'd always just be like, well, what's the assumption? Like, what, di how much dynamic range? Like, and, and who says like, who the hell are you to tell me anything about my art? It's art. I'm not like, you know, anyways. And then now with loudness normalization, all it ever happens is that, you know, um, 0, 0.0 uh, dBFS. So minus 0 0.1 when you were transferring from from tape, from DAT digital audio tape to yeah. Glass Master in the mid 90s, right? <laughs> um then, then we start getting more in the box, more electronic. We can, oh my God, we can basically have square waves that sound awesome. So right. then we start pegging to like ridiculous numbers. Depends on what your number, what your, your meter is, but like minus six RMS, you know? Right. And then, and then now all that's happened is we're going to peg to minus 12 LUFS and you just have a different meter. And right. you're going to try to do your tricks to make it as loud as possible, sound as loud as possible within within that, you know, metering protocol. Right. So right. I'm here to tell you that if you're paying 150 bucks as opposed to like a thousand bucks and the person who you're paying a thousand bucks to is saying, well, they haven't cared. Bull. It's red car, blue car. Do you like how it sounds? Right. And no one has ever wanted their track to come out significantly quieter than yeah. the mainstream. My question then is what do you see it when you say it's obsolete and it's changing? What's it changing to? Is it becoming more creative where it's, it is more of that step? Cause it, it seems kind of split to be honest. It, from my perspective, yeah. it mm -hmm. seems very split. Some people are like, I just it want the split. loud thing. Some yep. people are like, I want more creativity. You know, I think it is mastering split. engineers want to do more, creativity potentially nowadays or newer guys what where's it going where when you say it's changing what's this shift that you're seeing i wrote a, an article but it was it was in this like academic volume um so it'll just be forever lost in some it'll be like you know the ark of the covenant in indiana jones someone yeah, someday yeah, will be yeah. like, oh my goodness so my argument was that the move towards ai and automating particularly the dynamic aspects and the dynamic equalization aspects of mastering um, was mastering engineers fault. Cause if you purport to do a kind of mathematics that the people you're marketing your, your, your work to don't understand, and that's really why you purport to do it, then why not figure it out mathematically, model it, do it that way, automate it. That makes sense. Um, 
But my, th I had a major issue with that, right? Like my problem with that is that there is all these other, there are all these other things that you are doing that are artistic. And to pretend otherwise is really chicken. Uh, because I teach, I have a lot of experience with people who are entering um, this kind of creativity. Forget even the industry. They're just like learning to speak this new language, learning the tools, even learning to hear it, right? And so uh, what I find is that very quickly, they develop this like list of things you have to do to make a good record. I bust off to this reverb, I high passed this, I threw a sample delay and then did this, my record's good. And it's all just emotional reassurance, right? Because you don't have industry feedback. Uh, I, by the time I was, by the time I'd enrolled even in MA in like 2000, I'd been doing this long enough. My, like I'd, I'd been in situations where like two years later, my buddy played the Super Bowl halftime show, my old guitar player, right? And I shouldn't say my old guitar player. He was like way more established than me at the time, but <laughs> we would play. And um, and so you get like, it. I mean, I never came close to that. That's not what I'm saying. What I'm saying is that it, you see, and you've worked with these massive bands that, that yeah, put out this yeah. stuff. And, you know... Once that happens, you no longer ever approach something as though there's this there's like this opaque magic behind it that you don't understand. Um, and so uh, that was sort of like that's the 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 part where you say, oh, it's purely emotional. It's pure. I have to say I did this. I like it. I know that most of the world is going to actually be indifferent to it. Um, and that's the hard part. They're just going to be indifferent to my entire life's work, you know, and a lot of people are going to really dislike it. Yep. Uh, but the more you, you are, the more people will want to work with you. And that's this great feedback loop. You have to take a lot of rejection like Leonard yep. Cohen. I'm sure there were a lot of vocalists early on when he was making it who were like, what the hell are you doing? But right. it takes what, like 18 milliseconds and you go, oh, it's Leonard Cohen. I right. like Leonard Cohen. I want to hear Leonard Cohen or Bob Dylan or whoever. Yep. Robert Plant yep. even. Robert Plant doesn't yep. have a great voice. He's but he's a fan. But he's got one of the greatest rock voices ever. <laughs> I, yeah, I yeah, saw yeah, your yeah. face. Tot yeah, <laughs> you were like, wait a second, where are we going wait, here? Hold on a minute. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> no, but, but right? it's very true that some people really like certain things, and some people really don't like the same thing. Like the amount of yeah. old records. That people are like, that's the best thing ever. And I'm like, yes. yeah, but I don't like it because it doesn't sound what I like what I want. I can appreciate it. Sure. I can I yep. can appreciate what they did because yep. I, of the position that I'm in and what I do. I, I, yeah. Absolutely. But yep. that doesn't mean I have to put it on my phone and listen to no, it. No, it's like you know? it's like uh, taking Jackson Pollock to task because mm -hmm. he doesn't paint in this hyper realistic way. You know, like right. the cover of that pup album, that that pencil drawing, right? Yep. It would be yep. like taking that and then comparing it to like the most outrageous abstract expressionism. They're both the same kind of creativity. Totally. And it's just different aesthetics. Yeah. Um, yeah. And you're going to go to the abstract expressionist mm -hmm. for what the abstract expressionist sees and does. And yeah. there's going to be a lot of sifting. You're going to like that. And this was my approach. Like I have to clear thousands of tracks and like, you know, if there's any artistry in there, it's a question of sifting through what was artisanally done versus what was like a moment. Whereas somebody who does these really hyper-realistic pencil drawings like Adam Ayan or Bob Ludwig or someone like that, these like amazing, amazing mastering engineers, um, they're brilliant in a very different way, you know? And, and so, and they can reproduce that brilliance with a form of dependence and routineness where they deserve the paycheck because you're going to pay them and they're going to give you back this craftsmanship. Whereas if you're coming to, to an abstract expressionist, it may be that they don't have blue in that week and you're getting a bunch of paintings and you got to write them back and say, dude, I asked for blue, you know, and yeah, then they yeah, give yeah. you this thing and you're like, awesome. Yeah. But you yeah, got, totally. you got, you got like, it's a bit more of a process. <laughs> it's a, yeah. It's a different approach. <laughs> it's yeah. a different thing. I think a lot of people think about mastering, in the technical sense, especially people coming up. Yes. That's what I hear a lot sure. of. But yep. I want to know, as a mastering engineer, what 
would you say is something that you do to bring out the creativity in your work? So every, every last move that you make in mastering, the language may be different. So just like an audio engineer may be listening to a guitar and they're about to do some equalizing to change the perspective on a performance, to bring out some aspect of that performance, some emotion, some bite, maybe even just like the technical proficiency. And you're going to think about that performance in terms of hertz and kilohertz and decibels, um, uh, boosts, cuts, cue values. Mastering's no different. It just has a different language. So I, I wanted to say that initially because I think a lot of the artistry of mastering comes in with imaging um, and, and balance, but in a very different sense than people... I think might understand that term because with, with mastering, it really is. Uh, I mean, you know, this from mixing, mixing um, just triggers my OCD. Like I have obsessive compulsive disorder and it's just right. so goddamn like, it's too much just because <laughs> you do this. And then that house of cards falls down and you're like, yep. damn it. And you built that up and you're like, but wait, now that doesn't work, you know? <laughs> and, and mastering's very similar, but whereas mixing for me is like a house of cards, Yep. There's a lot of components that need to be balanced. Mastering is a bit more like Jenga. There's a bruteness gotcha. to it. You know, there's there's like a different kind of balance. Uh, you know, us yogi folks will say like tensegrity, you know. You, you yeah, think, yeah. Yeah, you think in like, you think in terms of like prisms and the way light goes through prisms as right. opposed to the value necessarily of the the light value of the the purple that's violet that's coming through or something yeah so for me a, the, a lot of the artistry is in um the 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 waves the transient nature of a track um and whether or not the transients are 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 more peaked or less peaked has an emotional impact um balance itself has an emotional impact and loudness uh, like, it's just all, all these things, just like engineers, in order to have that language, because you're talking about an audio perspective on something, but you understand it has like, you know, you talk about hyping a sound source or something like, I'm oh, I need, let's really like, let's crush that. We all know what we mean when we say, let's crush that. Totally. Or like, let yeah, or that's ice picky or something, you know, everybody yeah. knows what you, it's this shared language. It's this shared artistic language. Mm. Mastering is very similar, only mastering engineers, um, we're even weirder. We just sit in this like soundproof room <laughs> listening to like banging death metal. You know? Right. But, like, yeah. <laughs> but then, and then like, and then like the stapler guy in office space, you like write to the, to the, to the label head and you're like, I, I would like to submit this for your consideration. <laughs> and they write back and say, can we do this? And you're like, but I was told I would have a stapler, you know, <laughs> but that's yeah. what it is. Yeah. Um, right. And, uh, and so, th I mean, think about, uh, you know, uh, a painting you've seen that was just massive in scale and ask yourself, what would that feel like if it was condensed down to a tiny size? And those are the aspects and the considerations that the mastering engineer is responsible for just by nature of the production process. Now that said, um, maybe the mastering engineer isn't involved. Maybe the mix person has done a mix and they've just uploaded it to like, you know, some automated AI mastering algorithm that comes back and, and they like it. That was mastering for them too, because the sound is altered. It's different. It's more exciting. I would say I developed a lot of like personal moves. I play with phase in a way that um, uh, most of my fellow like capital E engineers would consider awful. I, I will I will send program into mic pre's. You know, oh. that's like that's a big one. You okay. have to be really careful about clicks and pops. But, yeah, of course. Like, yep. yeah. <laughs> and you're coming out at like minus twenty, but like yep, yep. I'll I'll do that to get if I want like a really, really hyped sound or I really you know, it's the same difference. Why would you go to an API versus a Neve, you know, versus right. SSL? What are the differences? Why would you play a Tele versus a Les Paul? It's not like a guitar player only has one type of Les Paul ever. And yeah. I don't want anything else in my house, you know? Um, 
Yeah. And so, uh, but I mean, with mastering, because of the way I, I work, I was able to develop these like really strange things. Like for those club mixes, someone would say, I want like this, like just unbelievably wide mid range. And I would, I would band pass a part of it, send it off, bus it, throw a band pass at like, you know, 1K to 3K, put on a sample delay so the damn thing was like ahead of everything else, you know, and then, but bring it back in such a way that it's only really interacting with the, the hits of the hi-hats. And you get these really neat, different ways, different arrangements, you know, different cinematographies. Um, yeah, so, and ultimately, you know, cinematography is like what you see when you watch a movie, nothing else. Everything ultimately is under that, but the cinematography is not the creative act. So, so that's what I would say is the creativity. It's this like creativity that's dependent on creativity. And the other thing I'll also say, a lot of academics try to sidestep what you and I do and would look at our, our conversation even right now as like this elitist exclusionary conversation. It's always really bugged me because first of all, these are people who have like, all you got to do is crack the spine of a textbook and go, oh, that's what a Hertz is. That's why they're saying it. You know, it's like, and how hard is it? I mean, I don't know what tessitura is or call or bell canto or any of that stuff, you know? Yeah. Um, yeah. And, and like, or, or what's the difference between forte and forte forte and fortissimo and all that stuff. Like we all have our languages, yeah. but um, they will, uh, as a strategy, adopt what's known as this post-structural critique where talking about records, the reception is is sovereign and so how i interpret what i'm hearing matters well for me as a mastering engineer there's there's a lot of these like moments of reception along the way chain of the production process where it circles back my audience isn't the listening audience my audience is either the artist the mix engineer or the label head that's right. a very informed specialist uh listener right uh and so i've and i always i i'm always fascinated with the fact that it is the like black box part of the network, uh, the network for most people, right. because it's it's the last thing you hear. Again, like cinematography, I wouldn't be able to tell you what cinematography really is, short of like where the camera is, the view, all that kind of stuff. Right. I wouldn't know anything about it, but right. I can tell you all about Quentin Tarantino. I love how you brought up that your audience, so to speak, is not necessarily. The, I mean, it is, but it's not. Um, how, how do you deal with clients when they come back to you and go, we want this different or we want this change? Do you accept it? Do you go, well, actually, I th I think in my professional opinion or yeah, like, yeah. how do you deal with that kind of This was, yeah. This was, yeah I, <laughs> notes, mark back. Notes, um, mark back. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Um, well, first of all, um, this is a skill I consciously developed and it mm -hmm. took me a long time. When I first started really working, um, when I got notes back, I would panic. Um, but I wouldn't experience it as panic because the one thing that would be intolerable to me would be to actually acknowledge that there is no set mastering process, just like there is no set mix process. There's a few endpoints, but how you get there, I mean, I did, I did a book of interviews with like some of the world's leading mastering engineers. And what I learned from it is that everybody works differently. And you just, as long as you're pegging it to the right place, it's good. Um, and that's my view of everything. Every recording technique, for some reason, we teach it according to the psychoacoustic principles it operationalizes, but it was an accident that got repeated over and over and over again. And then the next generation learned how to do it. And then the next generation learned it as the skill, you know? So, um, so there's this fear initially, I don't know what I'm doing. Um, uh, I don't have enough experience. I'm, you know, there's a little bit of like fake it till you make it in a, in any freelance world. Um, but you have to deliver. So I made a point of really digging into the fact that I wanted to learn. Um, and, and as far as I was concerned, nobody in the research world in the university capital U back then, it was much more, Mm -hmm. uh, even 15, 16 years ago, it was much more like, oh, you're at a university, you're at a college. That was my first hurdle I had to get over. Right. Um, but that that there was this false expertise. And the real expertise was like, you're sending me a mix. So you are the expert. And so I would go through 
a lot initially early on. I'd even go on. You remember Gear Sluts and those? Oh, yeah. It's such an unfortunate name. It's banned on the university, but it's like, and I'd go on there and I'd ask. I'd say, "How do you deal with with feedback?" Because I have this big emotional well. And then very quickly, I realized it was like everything else. Everyone had their own sort of way. Slowly over time, I realized, oh, it's all relationships. It's about me learning too. Um, And so I would would make a point very early on. I would say explicitly to everyone, especially if I was going to work with a label, I would say, all I ask is that you stick with me. That even if in the process of clearing this record or a record we're working on 16 months from now, you hate me, stick with me, please, because I'm trying to learn what you want. And as much as you're reading Bob Katz and he's convincing you that this is solving for X, it's not at all. You have an emotional investment in this piece of creativity and I'm trying to help actualize it and add my voice to it. Um, which you've asked me to do. The other thing I would always say is, and then so so that went on, and then time went on, and I, I'd done enough work. I'd I'd had uh, you know uh, a few records that I worked on, got nominated for Junos, and that was a big moment for me because I was like, oh, well, I, I mean, whether or not I know what I'm doing, it's an accident that's going to get repeated, you know. And so, well, there you go. I know what well, I'm doing. Clearly, now. people like it. Yeah, <laughs> yeah exactly. Yeah. It works. Um, and so after that point, uh, it became much less about, um, oh no, I don't know what I'm doing. Will they fire me? Will I, you know, will I never be able to work again? And it became much more about like relationships, work, developing relationships, working with people, getting like, if you sent me something, I would know immediately, uh, don't high pass it at 30. Don't squeeze it. So it's this big, but that's, you know, I've also got stuff from people who've been like, squeeze it so it you know what i mean and <laughs> the exact so, uh, opposite yeah, yeah totally yeah so you start to like it becomes more of a relationship thing and you start to say stuff like you know honestly man you may be looking for a blue car and i'm a red car and i don't take that personally and just promise me the next one comes back to me give me a chance to fail enough to meet what you're looking for where we can both say, yeah, yeah, we're wasting each other's times. Thank you. Right. To, to definitely know that uh, you are def- I'm definitely looking for a red car and you are definitely yes. a blue car and they're yeah, not ex- going to align. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 Absolutely. I'm a Volvo. You want a Porsche. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> they're both expensive. <laughs> they're just different. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. I think that's really yeah. important though, is, is knowing that it's not a personal attack and also, having having that kind of um willingness from both sides to continue working with the people because i i know that feeling very well myself going am i going to be the engineer am i going to get fired and (laughs) it took forever to go it it took a while for me to go you know what it it might be different that doesn't mean i don't know what i'm doing it's they want something different and that's totally fine that's the world of creativity like well that's that's when you first become really creative when you're like i would do this like i said i do things with phase um that you know a lot of my colleagues would would truly consider like sacrilegious um and have told me never ever advertise that right (laughs) And here you are advertising. That's it. what I do. I know. I'm like, hey, listen, you know, if it, like I, I'm lucky enough to be at the point in my life where, uh, and to, to have gotten somewhere where I only work on what I want to work with. And most of the time I just work on friends stuff. Right. You know what I mean? Like totally. uh, that's, that's where I'm at now. The thing is, is being comfortable in your own creativity is kind of step one to, to being able to do that. That's not it. even comfortable, like not even just having enough work, not just being comfortable in your own process and your own creativity in your own. This is my sound or this is what I like. That'll actually well, yeah. get you further than trying to like kowtow to everybody that comes in going, Absolutely. oh, I can do a kind of a blue, but it's actually going to be like a green car. <laughs> you yeah. know? Abs- like, Absolutely. I will say, actually, that's a very good point, too. Um, and, and it goes back to your question before in terms of feedback, I was Mm. always very clear if I didn't know. Right. And, um, or if I felt some, I mean, one of the frustrating things about mastering is some people want a process. 
So right. you might give them something that that they even wind up landing on four weeks later, but they can't because they're so insecure about their creativity. They can't. They have to feel like they worked really hard for it to be any good. Yeah. Um, and uh, and so you go back and forth. And with those people, for instance, that's when at some point y- you say like, okay, you've asked me to make the bridge brown. Can you put that in terms of decibels and <laughs> frequency yeah. areas? Yeah, you know. Yeah. Um, yeah. And, and and but that's not even like that's not this this. Some people might use that as like this. That's like that's a moment where the control room door might close and people and, you know, will bitch together. But if you look at it from another point of view, saying they don't understand that about this process. um, And so I'm going to be patient and actually like have this interaction with them and learn. You do develop that relationship. So the next time it only takes two weeks. And then the next time after that, you start this long run where there's no notes. You know, because you're you're on the same page. So my my point of view is that and this is something where it's like this is why it doesn't sell mastering textbooks because it's it's like one sentence. But it's that like the entire world runs by relationships and creativity is a process of relationships. Um, Yeah, it's assumed you're good. If you're no good, you'll wash out. By yeah. by the you're time not last you're like long. <laughs> no, exactly. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. It really is all about relationships, and that's with any part of the creative process of the technical process of everything uh, of yeah. everything. Frankly, but like you know, if you're if you like working with somebody, you're willing to deal with either them not getting it right the first time, or you just know yes. that they've got it right. The- Right away, it's like, right, like I, exactly. I love um, what Jeff Emmerich. I think it was Jeff Emmerich. Somebody mm-hmm. asked him once. They said, "How did how did you get Paul McCartney's tone on those records?" Mm-hmm. And he said, "I got I got a mic and I pointed it at his amp." <laughs> That's a relationship yeah. thing. That's like knowing, hey man, this guy knows what he's doing. It sounds totally. good. And and that's, I mean, whether or not you're Team Paul or not, there is like a a Paulness to all the Beatles bass. Yeah. So much so that when I was recording with Al the first time, yeah. Uh, of course, he gave me like the two a.m. to five a.m. slot. Yep. <laughs> and I was trying to play a, a bass part for this like this track that remember Poacher way back then was yeah, like yeah. really coming from like Tool that area. Oh, and yeah. I started playing like this like bass line, and he was like, "That's Paul McCartney." And the the the, the thing that really pissed me off is I was like, God damn it. I totally stole it from Paul McCartney. <laughs> and I know I did. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Like I consciously did. I was like, I don't know what to yeah. do here. I'm going to, yeah, you know, totally. um, but, but that's a, but that moment is a relationship moment, you know? Yes. And, and sometimes that's people will say in mastering, well, you know, with this one, I just put a limiter on it. I just slapped a limiter on it and, and it was done. That's a relationship thing too. You have yeah. to, the art, the client or the artist has to have trust in the engineer that they know. Yep. And the engineer has to have trust in the artist that it could, in the first instance, come in and require nothing more than a little nudge. But yep. that little nudge is still mastering because you're a curator. Yep. You know, and, and you trust that the person is not going to be lazy and just throw a limit. That's on right. It yes. Versus That's right. Yeah. want to be like, they know yes. when it, you trust that they know what the right thing is to do and yes. their expertise that you are entrusting them. This is why you work Abs- with them. They're Absolutely. either going to do a yes. whole bunch of stuff or almost nothing at all. And you are, are just going, yes, I know this person's going to do whatever is required for yes. my vision and their vision com- combined. <laughs> right. I guess. Absolutely. Right? Yeah. Yeah, Absolutely. And I think I think the the aspect that really sank mastering in the traditional sense mm-hmm. was um, if you've been at this for a long time, I think there's a kind of humility um, that is necessary. It's the opposite of what you think. You 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 descend lower and lower from the ivory tower and more and more into the world as you work. You know, you just, you don't have standards. You don't have, you know what I mean? Like you're, you're, or your only standard is, is, is like an integrity where you're like, I did what I wanted to do. Um, I just think that there's a lot of people who got into mastering because they mistook desiring to master they 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 misplaced they they saw that and it was like a way to like sublimate gear lust these were just collectors of 
of technology. Um, some of the best mastering engineers I know uh, have ridiculous setups, like a laptop going headphone out. In, you know what I mean? Like just, yeah. rid- but you listen to it and... Again, it's like that Jenga tower. They've they've got they have good gear in there. They have somewhere in the line is like you know uh, an Alicia Alpha Comp that like is worth more than my car. Right. Maybe maybe it's bypassed. You know, <laughs> like but it's like totally they but and and I th- I see that as a kind of humility where absolutely where you, yeah you take yourself out of the equation. And you actually admit and say there was nothing for me to do short of the very final step. I love that you're, you're when you bring it back to those people that sometimes they're, they're literally on a laptop with head, whatever. Like, you know, you, you, we've heard the story of uh, who was it? Andrew Sheps, who suddenly yeah. he switched to mixing on a laptop and didn't tell anybody. And yeah, yes. we all know he's got like massive amounts of gear. Yeah, and of all. course. Yeah, and yeah. He, he didn't tell anybody. And then he asked his, his mastering guy like yep. a number of records later and said, so you know, notice anything about my mixes. And, uh, and he was like, no, why? He's like, okay, cool. <laughs> like, yeah, exactly. didn't tell anybody, but it's the skill that he has and the trust that his clients have in him and everybody all around the relationships that he's built. And he's very, very talented. Now I will As- say that that's the alleged yeah. story. I don't know the facts, so but let, let me, let me tell you a story. Yeah. Uh, and I'm going to anonymize this. Um, but this is a record that did well. Uh, so initially when I started, I was almost purely analog. The, the other than my, my, um, my, my ADDA, other than that, I was pretty much analog. Mm -hmm. Um, now when you're working in underground techno, uh, if you have any revisions, like those tracks are like nine minutes, 12 minutes, sometimes any revisions, anything that happens, like it's a long day to clear a four track EP. At some point I got, I was lucky. I got like so busy. I couldn't keep up. I never advertised. I never even did a website. Like I just, I, I prided myself on the fact that it was word of mouth and I just get emails. Um, every morning I'd wake up and I'd be like, what are we doing today? You know? Um, and, uh, at some point in a conversation with, uh, Russ Hepworth Sawyers at Motto Sound over in England, who I worked with a lot, um, and who I love dearly, uh, but he's such a British dude in that he's like, he has a method. There's a, he makes fun of all my shit, <laughs> you know, <laughs> he makes, yeah, but, um, but I will say I clear the techno. I clear the the loud, angry stuff. You know. Right. Um, but but the, uh, the there's a, and there's a point here. I promise. <laughs> but but the, at some point, he, you know, he's in the box. Right. And he's on like Sequoia, and he's got like good in the box. You know, he's not just sort of like running Audacity and and like right. doing stuff. Which maybe that works for some maybe people. Maybe that works. Know, but anyway, knows? yeah, exactly. But. <laughs> But he would sort of say, like, I can do a lot more. My recalls are better. That interaction with the artist is better. And so uh, I started to get things right near the end of the electronic wave when things got really loud. There's a point where analog just can't push it, right? Like, it's just you're going you're gonna to go past, you're going to go into nonlinearity in such a way that it just sounds like, you know, this is not just like sweet distortion. This is not harmonic distortion. This is the sound of like a machine breaking up, you know? <laughs> and um, anyways, and so uh, I was kind of annoyed with this one artist who I cleared like about 16 months worth of stuff for them. And they were starting to like complain and be really like mean about it, you know? And where I was like, hey man, you know, I... I I understand, like, I'm providing you value, too, you know? Anyways, so I got really annoyed, so I ran this record completely in the box. I didn't spend much time on it, loud as can be, and they wrote back, and for the first time in, like, two months, they were like, this is really good, man. You've done something. And I was like, what the hell? So anyway, so I, obviously you don't say anything, right? And so I started running uh, this trial because I could. Uh, so for the next six or eight months, every time I cleared a track, I would do two versions, one completely in the box and one with an analog line. And I wouldn't tell them which is which, but I would tell them that that was what was happening. Without exception, and we're talking again, like 800 tracks maybe, uh, without exception, 
the digital line was chosen and then every so often the the in the exchange that would come back and forth the client would say that was the analog line wasn't it you know and they would they I'd, wow. and they, of course you'd want to write back and say like oh you have expensive taste I fu- so that's changed now, but there was, a, yeah. you would know this. This is like your generation too, where it's like the analog, there was this cachet to analog. Now yes. I'm back analog just because I like it. It's a bit like yeah. a Japanese tea ceremony for me. I like, right. I like the process of it, you know, but, um, but I was fascinated by that. That's you know, it was, yeah. yeah, it was anyways. And so that's how I went in the box. I've seen it a few number of times. Uh, 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 an engineer that I used to work with a ton who taught me so much. He was a massive analog guy, came up through the years and over the years of even me working with him, he was going more and more and more in the box. People were still very much like these mixes, but he was like, man, the recalls are faster. Like we're working on SSLs with gear and he's just like the recalls, we need to do a whole record in five days or whatever it is here and there. And it, it's like I can't, I can't, I can't recall everything during your smoke break if we're using yes. all of the gear. <laughs> yes, <laughs> like so. It I, have, work. <laughs> I have a, I have a theory about this. Um, yeah. and I'm gonna because this is how I am, man. I'm gonna give you my theory. I love and, it. Um, yeah. <laughs> um, so we've actually moved increasingly away from sound quality as a definable value in listening. Mm. And I think that that's a part of it right. uh, insofar as you really can't tell the dip. I mean, I will, if I put something through um, uh, my API box yep. and my 550B little 500 series EQs, they're a secret weapon for low end because my God, they just beef it up, but it's clear. I just, all you got to do yeah. is put them in, you know, the, right. the, the topology work. Yeah. Anyways. Um, and uh, I, I, you can't get that with digital. I just, I cannot replicate that sound. Right. I don't know whether it's better or worse, but it's different. Right. It's dirtier. It's less clear. Um, mm. You know, anyways, there's, there's a little bit of saturation if you do it right. But, but. We now listen back in such a way that you're not going to hear that anyway. The, the, the final little caveat, the ray of hope, I think, that I'll add to that is um, I don't think streaming is forever. Mm. Okay. Um, we've, we tend to talk about Spotify, for instance, as though it had this kind of finality. There's right. never been a format in popular music that has a finality. Um, if no. Facebook managed to beat Spotify to mass adoption in streaming music, don't forget Spotify was a file sharing company. They were actually working on a, on an algorithm to using, I think it was AI to sort of predict what you'd listen to next. So they could download 20 seconds of everything. So you right. didn't have buffering. That yeah. was like their main thing. Right. Um, but if let's say Facebook beat them to it or invested in it at that time, they could have won. Yeah. We would have a very different notion of what of what you know streaming music was. Totally. Um, yeah, and I think that there's now some artists have this mistaken view where they treat Spotify like social media, where they they consider their success in terms of number of streams. Yeah. Which is why I wish Spotify like there's no other playback service that tallies the number of streams Spotify's smart to do that because the real market in music is the people trying to make it right yeah. and um and so if you but i i mean it, my students tend this is a hard one for them but i always i i i do experiments and i'm like look i went to band camp mm-hmm. and i created these prints and i sold them for three bucks and there were five of them and i made 15 bucks over this weekend now do the math how many streams on Spotify would it take you to make 15 bucks? Also, were the people, were you content for, for gadget consumption? Are you content for Spotify? Or have you had an interaction? So it's an ego hit, right? It's yeah. like, you, you, I'm going to interact with my 10, the beginning 10. But that's actually what an audience is. Yeah. That's an audience for an artist. Yeah. Anything else is just content for music social media, which is what streaming is. Yep. or social media or anything like that, you know, and uh, I'm not convinced that it's financially sustainable. 
I think there's there's a tipping point. You're right because the if artists can't make it or make money and sustain making for it, like there's a lot of them that put a lot of time and energy into just continuously pumping out tracks, pumping out tracks to get those numbers. Mm-hmm. People can't sustain that for a long time. We're still in the in the amount of years that they can to try yeah, and get yeah. somewhere, but. If they can't do that, then there's no more new content on Spotify, which means that it's irrelevant to the listener because the listeners can't go, we'll make more content. Well, you're not paying for it. Like there's a, there's a tipping point, right? At some point. Spotify is very much aware of this. They no longer put themselves forward as primarily a music uh, app, right? Podcasting away is from number it. one. Yeah. Absolutely. Uh, when Neil Young left, they were like, okay, great. So, you know, we'll, we'd rather have... Uh, first of all, you're not the demographic, Neil. <laughs> second of all, you know what I mean? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. And yeah. and second of all, yeah, like they because podcasting, you're listening for an hour, yeah. Um, or or whatever else it is, or you know the playlist or or algorithms that sort of thing. My concern is that um, enough time has we've gone down this road enough time where I'm beginning to really be reminded of the fact that. This industry, this cultural model for communicating only existed for about 110 years. Before right. that, something else was music. Right. Um, uh, just like, uh, and, and it may be that we're going the way of vaudeville, you mm. know. Um, and and this is a concern of mine uh, that I, I have no sound answer for right, right. now. Yeah, yeah. But that wheel, I think that wheel is definitely in spin. Right. Every time I... I, I, I I get to teach 18 to 22 year olds primarily. There's differences. I don't mean to essentialize yeah, them all, but like, yeah. like I get a lot of 18 to 22 every year. Um, and it's a, it's a really fascinating test market subject group mm-hmm. because I like to do things. Like I always walk in first day and say, how many of you have heard the Beatles strawberry fields forever? Right. right. Well, once upon a time, if you were going to go to a, you know, post-secondary education for music in any manner, of course, you've heard Strawberry Fields. You can probably talk a bit about the Mellotron, the production process, the fact it's two different tapes and two different tempos, you know. Yeah. Do you know the last three years, like one hand went up? Wow. And I'm sitting up there and I'm like, okay, it used to be like I'm old, but I'm like, that's the Beatles. Yeah, yeah. Like, that's a classic that's like, in music yeah. creation. It's like, yeah, it's like saying I want to be a novelist. Who's Shakespeare? You know what I mean? Like, yeah. Um, but then, but then the fascinating part for me is, then I will because of course it's unbelievable. It's like, what the hell are you talk? Then I play it for them. Ninety percent go, oh yeah, I've heard that. Right. Because they don't listen to artists and bands. They Spotify, and yep. so that's further to your point before. Where if I go onto Spotify and the algorithm says, you want to hear Pink Floyd's Shine On You Crazy Diamond. And I say, nah, actually, I'd rather hear something more up-tempo. So I'm going to put on like, you know, Tribe Called Quest or something. Right. I didn't have an interaction with Pink Floyd. I was just Spotifying because the whole world exists on Spotify, you know, and it becomes much less about me you know, interacting this artistic communication and much more about just sort of consumer electronics, appliances, that sort of thing. Yeah. And again, I try not, I try not to judge it because that's the surest way to miss the boat because something's always happening. But, um, but I, but I will say I'm, I'm concerned about it uh, insofar as there's this lineage, this craft, this like, you know, long standing way of being in the world that I love and dedicated everything to. And um, it may be that, you know, adapt or die and that we're in this like adaptation moment and that's okay, but, but it's sad in its way. Things shift. They always do. And it's, it's scary in a sense that we don't know what's next. Like we're in that weird middle zone of, we're not sure, but yeah, even when things went from vinyl to CD and then from CD to downloads and then downloads to streaming, every time we managed to adapt, that is, okay. But (laughs) that is, in my opinion, that is the voice of, of there's still some youthful optimism in you. (laughs) There's a finality to things too. And we often in an effort to be mature, intelligent, 
and open, we often neglect the fact of birth and death. Um, so yes, we can say movies and live theater are the same because they're both about drama and they're both about narrative, but they're different. And there's a finality to the death of theater in that, you know, and then someone would say, well, every time I watch politics, I'm watching theater. You're neglect, you, you are, you are instituting universals in place of specifics. And, and in so doing, you're neglecting the fact that you speak a particular language, you have a particular literacy, you were raised to worship particular gods. You know, there is a finality and I, I am, people really intensely don't like to hear it. And I hope I'm wrong. I really do because I love it so much. But I, I wonder, I'm actually at a point where I don't just sort of like, you know, this isn't Johnny Walker wisdom at 2 a.m. What if, man? I like, I'm truly wondering if we're not, if we're not becoming something else entirely. Because what I did in the mid 90s has nothing to do with with what's happening now nothing whatsoever there is no band that's going to break through in a way that let's say like pearl jam or soundgarden or nirvana alice in chains this is my childhood but these were bands stone temple pilots that broke through they were made they were paid but they were bands that broke through um and i just don't think we have that kind of coherence we're too diffuse there's so much out there things are so different than they were back then when there were 10 bands now there's yeah exactly a thousand of them it's it's yeah. harder to break through people's attention spans are smaller so you you're right and there's things like spotify where you interact with spotify and it gives you more stuff and you're like i don't know what that is but sure i'll just listen to it yeah it's a different con uh consuming uh, ritual than it used to be. It's a different. It's a yes. whole different landscape in that way. Yes, and if you look at it, then in terms of community, if that 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 consumption ritual is a, a term for basically a component in a communication chain, the communications changed. And if we and like you and I, the one thing like we know this, but we don't know it. Like I, I, I've spent years talking about this, and I still can't get it through my head. We represent sound using sound, but we would still say we're dealing with sound. You know what I mean? Like it's just like, <laughs> yeah, it's like it, it. And and in many ways, our whole life is dedicated to the performance practice of Daffy Duck. We're yeah. like doing these animations. And even we look at it and we see it as real. You know, it's like, yeah. it's this really interesting communication paradigm. Things have changed. That's, that's, for, and I think that's my, you know, as you put it, youthful optimism. Uh, yeah. It'll continue to change. And yeah, I, you know, for better or for worse, before it goes potentially for better or for worse again, we, we don't know, but. But nothing, we do know that nothing's eternal. So whatever exactly. it is we're talking about began at a point in time and, and will end. And it exactly. began in the, it, with the Berliner gramophone and we could very well be at the end. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> we don't know. <laughs> exactly. But I just, I don't hear people saying that. I'm not saying that there won't be music in video games. There won't be music in film, that people won't go see live music. Yeah, that yeah. people won't buy records. Again, there's a difference between obsolete and extinct. Yep. But when was the last time you saw a vaudeville show? When was the last time you bought sheet music? And Alexander's Ragtime Band was a million selling record in sheet music i bought sheet music a couple days ago so that one okay whatever we don't count <laughs> <laughs> oh man yeah i guarantee you did not buy alexander's ragtime band though i did not no that was not if, the if you did that's it my mind's blown yeah <laughs> no not yet but now i'm gonna go yes. do that just to be yeah. able to text you a photo of it <laughs> to say i did it yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> oh man well, oh, well. listen i appreciate your time very much you've you've been very <laughs> that was fun man <laughs> yeah i never get to geek out about this stuff i love it i love it i 
one question that I want to end off with in general, because I mean, you have a, a lot of interests and you obviously are very passionate about this. What is it about this whole music and musicality and making music and anything surrounding creativity, frankly, what is it about that that brings you the most joy and fulfillment? Uh, for me, it's a lineage. It's uh, a lineage like, uh, you might say, of like the Sanbo Kyoden school of Linchi Yishuan Zen Buddhism. You know, it's like there is a there is this strain of human beings who, from a young age, were like, it's not true of everyone, but most of us, I think, are like, nothing really seems worthwhile. A lot of us will put this in a way where nothing makes sense and I don't fit, but that's really just a way of justifying it. Nothing really seems worthwhile to me except for this, but for some reason, most of the people I know, they dig it and they think it's cool, but like I slowly realize over time that they, they you know, they really don't know that story about Sid Barrett and couldn't care less and you know, and they 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 can't sing along with the saxophone guitar solo. That's something those of us who listen can do, right? You go like when you're playing around, um, and 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 normally that also translates. You have your brain typically works in a dissociative way if you're into music, and so because of that, you lack the the you know concentration stamina to succeed in a lot of other places um, because, you know, and there's also this sort of hedonism and nihilism where we're like, screw it. I don't really care about the future. All I want to do is this. I want to meet girls. I want to get high. I want to have adventures. You know, this is like going to Mordor for me, you know, and, uh, and there's sort of like this kind of like outlaw bravery to it, um, which on hindsight is all pretty bourgeois. You're not starving. Um, although you do, I starved, you know, but you do it because you love this thing that's beyond you. And so really in a secular world, that is your, you know, worship of life energy. This, and it's passed on in a particular way. And it's probably not experienced that way right. uh, by a lot of people. There are a lot of people who probably are like, it's my job. I want to do this. But they probably also had a moment in life where that felt like mature and adaptive. Right. Where they were like, I'm never going to say artist. I'm always just going to talk about my job. I'm going to be nuts and bolts. Right. And that allowed you to engage in a professional way. But underneath it all, this is the only damn thing. Yeah. I have the same feeling when I think about making music mm. uh, and music itself as I have when I think about interacting with my wife and my kids. Right. So I, I, I really think it's like this. It's one of the many, many, many different manifestations of love. God, I'm wearing tie-dye, doesn't that suit? But I really <laughs> think it is. Yeah. yeah. And I think... Um, it is, uh, it exists outside of you, uh, so it doesn't give you what you want. Yep. Uh, and because of that, you have to grow and change. So I really do believe it's like this lineage. Um, it, it, it gives me this feeling. And the thing that's interesting about it, because I do other kinds of art too, is also there's, it's, it truly is like perfume. And, mm. um, I think this is why musicians are so prone to giving you their resume in a conversation. Right. Because they're like, I did do something, I promise you. You're Whereas right. in art, it's like, yeah, I'm hanging there. Or writing, it's like, yeah, I wrote this. Yeah. Um, yeah. But that's that's my favorite thing, honestly. It's the it's the it's a life. It's this beautiful, cool thing, and it's not anything anyone would ever choose because it's easy. No, you know, and because and because, yeah, it has to be fulfilling. That's what I love about it. And I like I have I have truly tender feelings towards it. <laughs> I can tell. And I love it. I love it so much. It comes it comes out in all of your answers and all of your discussions. And uh, right yeah, absolutely love it. This was fun, man. Thank you very much to Jay for joining us here on the Anna Creates podcast. And thank you very much to you for listening. I really hope you got some interesting insight out of that podcast. I know I sure did. A very different look at music creation and music appreciation in general. I mean, 
He's really just goes into some really interesting places. So I will see you in the next episode. Until then, leave a review on Apple Podcasts if you like the show and let me know what you would like to hear in this new season of the podcast, who you think I should get on, who would be interesting to talk to, and any questions you have for other music creators, mastery engineers, engineers, mixers, artists, all that kind of stuff. Anything you're curious about, about the world of music creation, let me know and I will put that in episodes to the various guests that I'm going to have on. So thank you again for listening and I'll see you in the next episode. Until then, always be creative.